Live Live, delighted to say we have Stephen Fry uh, joining us this afternoon. Stephen, how are you? I'm very well indeed, thank you. Very well, very summary. And it's it's splendid to have you on the show. And uh, the first thing that we need to talk about, because only we will address you on this issue, Mm -hmm. is how you came to be the narrator of Benjamin Snittlegrass and the Cauldron Cauldron of Penguins, Penguins. (laughs) which has now become a movie and uh, and there have been screenings and Jeremy Dillon, the listener who put it all together, is sort of, he's he's been in regular contact. But, you know, I should say that when Jeremy first said, I've got Stephen Fry to narrate it, we just thought, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Well, yes, I was in um, Australia um, doing this and that, filming and, uh, and doing a show at the Opera House. And uh, and this timid young fellow left a message at my hotel. Um, I was foolish enough to take a photograph of Sydney Harbour Bridge and the Opera House in the same shot, which proved I could only be staying in one room in one hotel in the entire world. <laughs> so he'd worked it a out. Bit of a dumb <laughs> thing. So he left a message asking uh, if he if if he might come and visit me in Ray Benjamin Snittlegrass. And uh, I just couldn't turn an opportunity like that down. He's very shy, very sweet man. And we managed to get the hotel to uh, close, close a bar. And he brought along his recording equipment. And I did my best. But I haven't actually... I, I've, I've seen little bits of it, but I, I don't know what stage it's in at the it's moment. Finished. It it's finished. It's done. No, it's no, out. No, it's completed. It oh, is yes. Completed. It's, it, it had its premiere. It had its premiere, and it's available on DVD, and they've been, they've been putting together DVD extras for quite a long time. I mean, I think the extras probably amounts along with this. Quite, it's quite a brief film. It's about it's an hour and seven minutes long. Mm, that's good and, uh, and, and yes, it's, it is exactly what it is. I mean, I laughed several times. Full of, full of in jokes. I mean, you'll know as you did the script referring yeah. to Aunt David Morrissey. Morrissey who, yes. of course, was on the show last time you were on the programme uh, as well. But um, when you said, of course, you know, you can't say no, actually, I would think most people in, in, in your position would have said no to this kid who's just wandered in saying, could you please narrate I this thing? would have got a restraining order. For me. I mean, there, were, but there must have been something about... I mean, did, well, he uh, used your names... Right. I mean, in, in vain. He, 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 he said, as authenticated by <laughs> the, right. the, the, the Mayo Command Axis. And that obviously was a, as an entree, in, as it is into the drawing rooms of the mighty the world around. <laughs> and, uh, I, 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 you know, the, the, there are some things that are, it, it depends on time, that are a pleasure to do. And uh, as you probably know, and as you probably are in the same boat or you wouldn't be in this profession things that involve the sound of your own voice are the easiest ones to say yes to uh, if there's a camera involved it's a bore because it takes so much longer and you, you're worried about how you look and what you're wearing and just uh, so much coverage but if it's just someone with a microphone it's everything's quick and easy and um, and pleasurable from one extreme to the other can we talk about the hobbit yes you know there's there's a little radio voiceover on the one hand and then there is what I imagine is going to be an all singing, all dancing, prosthetic laden <laughs> feast, uh, which you've agreed to do. So, wh- wh- is. what is your role? Uh, it doesn't involve having p- hair put on my feet, as far as I'm, <laughs> at least as far as I know. I'm the mayor of Lake Town, the master of Lake Town. It's a, 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 a corrupt, pompous official. Usually, when I look to see what my character is in any <laughs> film, I, the words <laughs> corrupt and pompous and middle aged appear. Um, it, it's been a fascinating genesis because I've been working with Peter Jackson for some time now on a uh, on a remake uh, which we're both very desperate to, to make at some point of the dam busters and that this is you know one of one of Britain's holiest movies. It, it is an almost perfectly made piece of war film entertainment. It, Michael Anderson's 1954 original is, is a really superb yeah. piece of work. And uh, as all film geeks know, it, it, it influenced even, you know, Star Wars. And, and there's, however, there are good reasons for remaking it. Um, there's much we know now that they didn't know at the time because it was secret. Such um, as? Um, well... Um, the nature of the of the bomb itself um, uh, it was it actually spun i mean just not only did it have to i mean it 's so absurd not only did it have to fly at first they thought one hundred and twenty feet and then oh, would you mind awfully if said Barnes Wallace, the inventor to Guy Gibson, who led the squadron, would you mind awfully making it sixty feet uh, and and uh, for, Tip to tip, if um, if it was sideways, it was about fifty nine foot of the, the airplane. Uh, the, the airplane, the Lancaster, so it was like a foot spare if, if you wanted to, to do a turn. Um, and this huge bomb um, was in sort of calipers under the under the airplane, um, and it spun 
I had a motor and it spun at 500 RPM. He got this idea from cricket, oddly enough. Um, and so someone had to be spinning it, and it dropped and and bounced and hit the masonry wall and then dropped, and then it, when it got to a certain depth, um, these uh, hydrostatic triggers made, made, made it explode. And the, the whole thing was so balmy, and the politics behind it was so... Harris, Bomber Harris, hated uh, all these... Anything new, anything... Sounded like a, a man in a pipe in a, in, in a jacket who had too many weird ideas. He hated all of it. Because there were some very silly ones. There were people who wanted to, um, uh, you know, have a whole load of rats um, flown over... <laughs> flown over the Black Forest with incendiary devices attached to them and then to be dropped <laughs> to be dropped on the Black Forest so that the Black Forest would burn down, which would be a propaganda coup against the... And <laughs> <laughs> There's a movie in that. Yeah, as he, as he said to the scientist, would you like to pilot um, a plane full of rats that are carrying incendiary devices? <laughs> oh, ah, yes, I see what you mean. Yes, I'll, I'll rethink that one. <laughs> you know, there were a lot of... And there were people who were... You know, there were sort of iceberg uh, aircraft carriers. I mean, there were some bizarre ideas, some of which worked and some of which didn't. But anyway, it, 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 Peter Jackson adores aviation, and he. Uh, it's the story behind it is that David um, Frost had bought the rights to the Paul Brick. Paul Brickhill book um, um, about the Dam Buster raid. Paul Brickhill was one of those writers one read when one was a child who wrote, you know, also about uh, Douglas Bader and, um, you know, the various uh, great escapes from prisons and things. And um, he was saying, I can't find anybody appropriate who can make a new film. And, and someone said, well, I was in uh, Wellington recently and I, I happened to be in Peter Jackson's office and he's got a huge poster of the Michael Anderson film uh, behind his um, desk. And they said, really? So he called him up, and a deal was done there and then. Wow. Um, and uh, I was involved in, in, in working on the script, which has been going on forever and ever, and it was through Universal. And then in the meantime, this Hobbit thing emerged. And now I, I, I did think I'm giving too much away here, and I should preface it all by saying that I'm, I'm not an insider in the world of Hollywood business, but as you know, MGM collapsed. MGM, which was once the greatest of them all, collapsed. You know, this is the gave us Irving Thalberg and the Thousand Stars and, you know, the, the great musicals and some of the um, most remarkable um, motion picture entertainment, as they like to call it, <coughs> that the world had known. Do you know the name of the MGM line? Uh, oh, no, what was it called? Leo. Leo, of yeah. course he was called Leo. You could have Leo. had a guess at that. I no, should, no, exactly. should have. There done. Pop <laughs> trivia question. Anyway, moving Ars on. Gratia <laughs> artists. I remember I'll that. scratch your artists if you scratch my <laughs> <eyes>. <laughs> Very good. Um, and they did, yes. I mean, it was this extraordinary studio. And um, and it just went into meltdown, as you know. And it was connected with United Artists, and therefore the Bond film co co collapsed as well while it was being made, the, second, the third Bond film. If you, all, you, all this is well known. So I'm told... Uh, that there were about 20 lawyers representing hundreds of people, all of whom owned a bit of MGM, who were creditors. And out of the ruins, because I think the backlist, uh, the, the catalogue, as it were, had already been sold, yeah. out of the ruins of what was MGM, only two things existed which were guaranteed to make money, and they were the Bond franchise and The Hobbit, which they still had the rights to. Uh, and it was getting those 20 lawyers to agree to make the films that took such an extraordinary length of time, which meant that Guillermo del Toro left, which is a real... Which is a sad thing, because I know he's in, uh, a director you greatly yeah, admire, as indeed do I, and as indeed does Peter, and they still have a very good relationship. It wasn't a, a row. He didn't stomp off in, in a huff. It was just it was simply... Just time. He'd run out of time. Well, I remember standing on Dean Street with Guillermo, coming out in the Nelly Dean pub and going, bye, Guillermo, see you in two years. Yes. And that, you know, and then that was it. And then, yeah. of course, he was... And then, of course, nothing happened because of all the stuff you were talking about. No, it yeah. was, there was never it was any falling out. It was just, yeah. But it's this bizarre thing that... That these lawyers were representing people who who were so sort of greedy and so desperate to have a little edge over the other person that you you felt like saying to them, so you would all rather have no money at all than a part of the billions that will accrue from the Bond and the Hobbit. Is that is that the situation? You just just close everything down. That's that would make you happy. And they they were almost saying yes because because their desire that not to have slightly less than someone else was greater than their desire to have any money at all. Yeah. But fortunately, eventually, common sense prevailed. 
then Peter got rather ill, and then there was the whole union business about... about it all got very yes. complicated. Then there was the terrible worry that Martin Freeman, who, let's face it, was put on this planet in order to play Bilbo Beckins, um, if one is a fan of these things, you know, mm. if you have a picture of a hobbit in your head, it is... Martin m- Freeman. Basically. Um, uh, had done, played Watson in this very successful Sherlock, um, the, the sort of updating by Mark Gates and Stephen Moffat on television of the Sherlock Holmes stories, and he'd been told that they were being picked up for a second series. And his immediate thought was, I can't do The Hobbit then, because the dates had been set and he, you know, his agents and various others called. Um, and there was this terrible moment when Martin thought, his, oh, God. I, I've got to go back and do Watson in a bit of a in a bit of a mood <laughs> because I won't be doing The Hobbit. But fortunately, again, wiser counsels prevailed, and the film got under and underway. And almost literally today, as we speak, I think the camera turns over for the first time properly down down there in the yeah. su- southern hemisphere. And the film, the two films, begin. I think they've named them. I can't remember what they are. There is it. The Hobbit one and two. You'd think, but it's probably like The Hobbit: A Certain Doubt and The <laughs> Hobbit: The <laughs> The Crown. Culture Crowning <laughs> prism. I don't know something, but they're, they're, they have titles. Um, and so, obviously, for, for the rest of us, um, e- even even the big boys like uh, Ian McKellen, I think have to fit in with the with, with the schedule of Martin, which is you know doing his bits and then coming back to do the Sherlock and then going back again. Wow. So, so it'll be uh, I'll be a lot of shuttling about. But, I, but I love New Zealand, so I'm being very happy to and be And with there. all that, I can understand why you might say yes to doing a voiceover for Benjamin Snittlegrass. Exactly. Because <laughs> it's all done and dusted within five <laughs> seconds. I'm sorry, Peter, <laughs> I just <laughs> have to sort this small Australian <laughs> project first. <laughs> yes. But you're, but you're been... mayor. You're, you're a human... I'm a human, mayor. yes, I'm a human. Are thing. you directly elected mayor? Are you I, I, very corrupt. I, I, I think originally I was uh, elected. I, th- I think somewhere between Mayor Quimby in, um, in, in The Simpsons, obviously without that accent, uh, and Adam West in Family Guy, if you watch that, which you probably don't. I've seen it. You have seen it. Oh, good. It's very good. Bob's Burgers is the next one to look out for. <laughs> okay. um, and uh, just, just to give you a list of cartoons <laughs> on television you, yes. okay. that you ought to be watching. Um, but before that, in fact, I, I go to South Africa to um, uh, working title uh, doing The Borrowers. Which oh, is, right. Yes, I was very surprised to, to get this script because I remember... They did the borrowers not that yeah, long ago. Jim Broadbent was Jim yeah, Broadbent in the eighties or early nineties. Yeah, yeah, and John Goodman, and indeed my friend Hugh Laurie was in it. Like in a, in a small part, and I, I remember visiting the set once. Uh, so I thought, oh, that's odd. But I read the script and I thought it was delightful and had a very who's written funny the script? Part. Oh, I knew you'd ask me that. Tells me how he had wrote the script. <laughs> and, uh, I've always admired him. Before. Yes, <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> Golly, I'm in trouble now with, <laughs> with everyone at Working Title. Uh, but so, and that starts in a few weeks when I finish QI, which I'm in the middle of at the moment. So I'd probably go straight from South Africa to, to, to New Zealand. So I'll be staying, while you're all having um, su- summer, I'll be having winter. The Hobbit films are called The Unexpected Journey and There and Back Again. Ah, that's good. Really? Yes. They're the names of the. Uh, they're the two films in which you star. Hibbity, hobbity, hibbity, hobbity, who? And is the mayor in both? Um, I think I think so. I, I take nothing for granted. I remember Christopher Lee was rather disappointed yes, was, that he <laughs> turned right. out not to be. I, I have understand. the most important <laughs> line in the... What, it's been cut? Or did, and the, 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 the terrible tragedy of that story is apparently Christopher Lee didn't find out until the premiere. I know, which was a bit unfortunate. No, it was terribly I mean, unfortunate. The but, new line or whoever was responsible. Yeah. Just sheer bad manners. But, really. but, but, but that's, you know, what? So yeah. you're saying that a, that a production company had behaved badly towards its actors? How to... <laughs> <laughs> the very thought 